This morning I'm uh, speaking on Luke chapter 14, uh, beginning at verse 16, and um, it's about the Great Supper. This is one of those psalms, this one is psalms, this is one of those proverbs, and when you read it, it's, it's, it's kind of like, okay, who, who's, who's what here, you know, who's who, who's on first, you know, uh, what is this all about? Well, the, the character is, the one who's giving the feast is God, okay? The people who are invited first are the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. And then the people who are invited second are the Gentiles. And so as we look at this and go through it, perhaps as we, you know, I'm going to do a, a verse by verse on this, that we can look at this and we can see how that God has a invitation. This is Jesus giving us this illustration. And uh, it's similar to what is in Matthew, I think it's in Matthew 14, but it's still, it's not the same one. It's not the same story, uh, just shortened up. It's, it's a different illustration, a different time. Now, the, in we, we studied in um, John, ending in the book of go the gospel on Wednesday, we found out that um, if, any, if all the things that Jesus did were in his three years were written down, it would be, you know, just astronomical. We'd never get through it. So Jesus just didn't do miracles here and there. And, you know, he, he, his whole life was one of teaching, ministering, um, dis displaying, as it were, his power over the earth, over the elements, over sickness, over the sea. You know, his whole life was about this. And so what we have in the Gospels is a, um, a snippet of what God has thought would be important for us to read and to know that he is God. So pa the parable of the Great Supper. Chapter 14 of Luke, verse 16. And it says, Then he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, A certain man gave a great supper uh, and invited many. So there is a great feast because of the number of people who, is, uh, who are invited. Now, as we said, the feast, the, the, there was a man who gave a great supper, and it is God. God is the one who is giving this great supper. And he's illustrating then in this, this few verses, he's illustrating the lack of appreciation for God and also a hatred for God. And everyone is invited to be a part of this supper, uh, this feast, and it would be a great, it's a great honor to be invited. I mean, God himself is the one who is initiating this. And, that, uh, and what a great blessing it would be to those who would show up. It's a great honor to be invited. It's a great blessing to show up. So he sent a servant out, and he says to them, um, come, you're all invited. Now, one of the things to keep in mind in this ancient culture, people always received two invitations. They received an invitation, you know, it's like save the date. <laughs> you know, you get the invitation to go to a wedding, save the date. So um, you get that in place, and then you get another invitation. In this case, you get an invitation when everything is ready. And when everything is ready, that means the feast is going to take one to three days, one to five days of celebration. So it's a great feast. So everyone who received the initial invitation, yes, will come. Okay, keep that in mind. God is sending out the invitations. He has sent it out to the nation of Israel. And they have all responded, yes, we will serve the Lord. Well, come, in verse 17, he says, he sent the servants uh, at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all things are now ready. You know, it's a big disappointment when you put together a party and nobody shows up. That ever happened to you? It happened once to us. I invited all the wrong people. <laughs> you know, after you look back on it, it says, why on earth did I invite these people, you know? So there's the people who did show up. We had a nice party. <laughs> but I think that's the only time it ever happened. But uh, there's only once it only uh, ever happened because then after that I learned my lesson, only invite people who are going to come. You're all invited to the great party. It's at uh, Glenda's house. <laughs> I didn't pick on you at all yet, Glenda, so I thought I would do something. So when Jesus said, um, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, it's kind of it's like the same invitation that God is giving to us, everyone who is laden, everyone who is heavy laden, everyone who has these difficulties, 
Jesus is inviting them to turn, that, that he invites them to come and turn to him so that their needs can be met, their, um, the problems they are facing, whether it's their human sin or human condition or the yoke of traditions, all these things, Jesus is inviting people to come and be with him. Now, that's an invitation. It's not this invitation to this great supper, but it is an invitation. And, and what we find in this is God always invites. God never pushes. <laughs> you know, God leads us into the kingdom of heaven. The devil drives people into hell. Addictions, you know, behavior that, you know, things that would be addictive behavior that drives people. They get hooked and they, they seemingly have no control over their addictive behavior. That's the devil. God doesn't addict people to Christianity. <laughs> you are drawn to Christ and you are, um, his word and his, the spirit influence us in our activities and in our actions. So come, for all things are ready. God's preparedness to receive everyone. God is prepared to receive everyone. I always go back to the, uh, the scripture that says, it is not the will of God that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So God doesn't want anyone to lose out and no, it's not his will that anyone go to hell. Verse 17 again says, come for all things are now ready. The guests for a wedding which could last a week were pre-invited. One thing to remember. All these people were pre-invited. Now, well, how are all of the Jewish people pre-invited? Well, you have Abraham, <laughs> you have Isaac and Jacob, then you have Moses, <laughs> then you have the prophets, then you have the King David, you have the judges, and then you have David, and, uh, and then the, the, the ones who follow after him, and all the other prophets. So these are the invitations to the nation of Israel for them to come to the feast, as it were. They are pre-invited guests, and... By the Old Testament, they are told to be ready for the arrival of the Messiah. They are told that a Messiah is coming. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. It is a declaration of Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, who he is, and what he would do. All of these things are fulfilled. That's, that's the prior invitation for the people to prepare themselves for the Messiah's coming. For us today, we have an invitation to come to Jesus. <laughs> um, we come to Christ for forgiveness we come to him for restoration we come to him for eternal life we come to him for the forgiveness of sin that which is what we have done wrong in thought, word, or deed whether it's things yesterday or today we ask for forgiveness to keep the, the heart clean before God and uh, get rid of those things which would drag us down and so by his death and resurrection, he has put all these things in place. We are called to a great feast also. Our great feast is whenever we are with Jesus in heaven, whenever we take communion, we talk about that, for Jesus will not participate with this again, drink of the wine, fruit of the wine until he does it anew with you in the Father's kingdom. So he has set that in place for us. That's our invitation and it's going to come, come to pass. Verse 18. This is one of those, uh, says, <laughs> But they all with one accord began to make excuses. First said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. <laughs> all right. Uh, excuses. Excuses are an, an expression of regret for a failure to do something. No. People say, I don't want to hear your excuses. I just want to see you do it. <laughs> I don't want to hear what didn't happen. I want to hear what you can do. So it is stated that we make excuses to protect us from our fears. I don't want to do that. It's like pushing against our comfort zone. We don't want to do that. So most common excuses are, I'm waiting for someone else. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't like that. <laughs> uh, it's not my fault. 
it's my husband, wife, kids, grandparents. It's, you know, it's the heat, it's the weather, it's, it's just not my fault. That's my favorite one. I haven't done that before. <laughs> That's a good excuse. So we make excuses because the event is not that important to us. I, was, I remember going to a seminar once, and the guy said about people making excuses. He said, what would it take to make sure you fulfill this one thing? And he, he, he listed what it was. And it was going to take place in, he said, I think it was New York City, in such a building, in such a room. And you are invited to go there. And you have made the appointment to show up. Now, if your life depended upon making that appointment, you would be there in advance, waiting for the event to happen because of the value of that appointment. Well, people make excuses because it's not that important. And Jesus, here in verse 18, I have, brought, I have bought, this excuse is wonderful, I've bought ground. I bought a piece of ground, and I have to go see it. Well, I have some beachfront property in Arizona. Lots of sand, no water until the California falls off the planet, and uh, you can buy it today cheap. <laughs> beachfront property. I bought ground, and I need to go look at it. That's a lame excuse, okay? So, again, these are, it's like Jesus is illustrating here how lame the excuses for the children of Israel, uh, th what they gave in their understanding or their acceptance of him as the Messiah. So, the, the lame, self-righteous <laughs> person, excuses are giving up on something, and there are many reasons. So, have you ever been invited to something that did not want to go, and uh, <laughs> you did not want to go? and uh, you made an excuse not to go? Or, well, uh, Rhonda came to the um, arcade last night. We were walking out of supper, and uh, the guy came out on the bus and said, we, yeah, I, have, I have one ticket to the musical that was there last night. Rhonda, do you want to go? Well, somebody made an excuse. <laughs> well, something happened, they couldn't go. I mean, because somebody can't go doesn't mean that it's a bad excuse, okay? I've broken my leg and I can't stand up. Okay, that's okay, you know. Uh, but anyhow, so Rhonda got to go and, you know, one man's folly is another man's treasure. So you, it just, you know, you just keep going around. So been invited <laughs> to the most important feast of all times. Invited by God himself to attend a feast. And they all said, yes. And then they said, well, I don't think so. It reminds me of the patient in the hospital. He had lung cancer, and um, he was not doing well. And I was there visiting him as the chaplain, and I was talking to him. So I said, you want me to have a prayer with you before I leave? And he was not a religious inclined to any type of religion at all. And his excuse was, <coughs> make it a quick one. i got to get some sleep. <laughs> I always remember that one. So... You, you see, people can make excuses. Don't, don't, make it. I don't, I'm not going to turn your prayer down, but make it quick, all right? So, I have bought, and but now. <laughs> I have bought something, but now I've got to go see it. Um, please allow me to be excused. See, the value of the invitation to this individual is not greater than putting off seeing the land that he had bought. The value of the invitation was not as great as going and see the land he'd already bought and didn't see it. Foolish. Verse nine, 19. This is even better. I've bought five yoke of oxen, <laughs> and I'm going to I'm going to go test them. Please excuse me. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, um, excuse me for my papers and my Bible, I kind of, I need it bigger. You know, I know preachers, those preachers on TV have big pulpits. You know, and they can spread out all their notes. I'm going to make something bigger here. But anyhow, it's like buying something on the Internet and paying cash and not knowing what it is until you get it. <laughs> it 
It's like seeing a picture of something and then what you get is completely opposite. How about, the, I love the scam. The, I don't love the scam, but the scam that calls you up and says, you have won $10,000. You need to send me $500 to process it plus the account of your, your checking account for us to deposit the $10,000 directly to your account. Please sign me up and send me, ten th send me $500. That's a scam. People did it. I bought five yoke of oxen. <laughs> it's the same thing. I bought five oxen, and I've got to go find out if they are worthless. <laughs> they don't, you know, he doesn't even know if they can pull a cart. They may be barely walking and barely alive. So the excuse is trifling. The excuse is meaningless. It's foolish talk. It's a waste of time to simply put these things in place. He has no interest in the banquet. He has no interest in God. See, Jesus is using this illustration to tell us about people who have been invited to be part of the kingdom of God. And this was Israel at the time. They were invited to be part of the kingdom of God and accept the Messiah. And so Jesus is using it. And, it, and the point is, for us, we are invited to be part of what God wants to do in our life. Now, are we going to follow through with that invitation? I won't pick on people who take Sunday off. You know, it's their only day. They got to sleep in. Life's hard. You should have grow up on a farm. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> Kyle's always needed milk. It's 6 o'clock in the morning. On holidays, birthdays, Easter, Christmas, you still went to the barn. <laughs> you know, there was no time off. Tell the cows, wait till next, tomorrow I'll milk you. You know, you don't you do that. You don't do that. I'll feed you tomorrow. You know, no, it's the, you know, it has to be done, it has to be done, it has to be done, it has to be done. Well, in our life, our relationship with God is not something that is trifle. It's not something that we can put off. Uh, it's something that we need to nourish our soul with. Our soul needs to hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. So when you hear the word of God, your faith is increasing. And so whenever we are, and we are being nourished by God so that we can recognize our need for God and we can pray, we can ask. If you have not because you ask not. So it's important for us to realize our dependency upon God but because God wants us to realize that. We are dependent on him. We are dependent on him for our next breath. Verse 20. I like this one. I've, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. What he's really saying is, my wife forbids me to get out of the house. <laughs> I'm not allowed to go out of the house. My wife won't let me. <laughs> Which is just, it's, that's funny. But anyhow, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not that sarcastic. But anyhow, in uh, Deuteronomy, people were, people were allowed to, to miss things and, and not serve in the military if they had just been married. Uh, but this is from the law of Moses. Um, they are building a house, planting a vineyard, uh, are grounds for exemption from military service. So what this guy is saying is, I've just gotten married, and I don't want to go be part of this laborious event of going to this banquet. <laughs> well, you see, men and women are invited to the highest spiritual blessings. We are invited to the highest and greatest of spiritual blessings. And look at the invitation, and they look at the invitation as invited, as an invitation called to a wearisome, burdensome, entanglement mesh of life devoid of meaning. People you invite to church, invite to know Christ. What are their excuses? How do they see a relationship with God? It's an entanglement of religions and messes and people and faith and, you know, this and that and people doing this. It's just a mess. But you see, 
we are invited to a place of the highest spiritual blessings. And spiritual governs the physical. Now, people, people use it the opposite. The physical governs the spiritual. Because I'm not going there, I'm not learning that, I'm not giving in, I'm not listening, I'm not being a part of this. I'm not coming to your banquet, I'm not coming to your church, I'm not going to pray, I'm not going to believe in God. So that's the physical thing saying, this is a mess and I don't believe in it. But what God is calling us is, this is the greatest event of all times. This is the greatest decision of a person's life. When you come to know Christ as your Savior and your sins are forgiven, that is, that is the moment eternal life begins in you. Eternal life in heaven begins. And our life with God is one that he has promised to comfort, strengthen, guide, has a plan and a purpose for our life. All of the greatest things in our life could happen whenever we have Christ in our life and we come to the supper, we come to the feast. Verse 21, so that servant came and reported. So the servant who went out and asked all the people to come to the feast, they had been invited. They said, yes, we're coming. And then they, the servant went out and asked, and they all gave an excuse. And we reported these things to the master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of, this, uh, of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. So what we have here is the master has deliberately, the master has been deliberately and willfully insulted. God the creator came to us in Christ. God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we and the Hebrew people, most, many of them, insulted God by saying, we don't want him. We can't believe that he is the Messiah. So <laughs> we see in this righteous indignation, and you know, whenever I, you read that, you think, okay, well, I'm, I'm angry with you, so therefore I'm going to go get these people out of spite. <laughs> well, it isn't that way. God is not out of spite coming against or coming for the, uh, the, the lame and the maimed. He says, these, these people whom he is inviting here are the ones that the Pharisees would consider unclean. These are the people that would not be invited to the Pharisees and to their banquets. And Jesus is saying, I'm inviting them to mine. And really, he's inviting the Gentiles, those who are on the outskirts of society. He is saying, I'm going to invite the Gentiles to be part of this feast because you have rejected it. Christ, the Hebrew people rejecting Christ and then coming to the Gentiles. We find that um, God called for the Jews to come to the feast. His chosen people. These are the first. You know, it said that whenever the gospel was sent out, you go to the Jews first. And that it was to them, because the, they are the ones to whom God has promised this blessing, the Messiah. They go to them first, <laughs> but they refused. So then he sent them out to the Gentiles. Verse 22, and he said to them, Master, it is done. You, uh, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. We find that in the kingdom of God, there's a vast room. <laughs> the kingdom of God does not get filled up. You know, there's a group, and you read in the book of Revelation, 144,000, there was a group that claimed that they, they were the 144,000, they were the only ones going to go to heaven, they were the only group going to heaven. Well, then when their group got greater than 144,000, they had to change their religion, they had to change their views on that. And we don't have to change our views. We don't have to change our views because the people of Israel, they, they didn't see the kingdom of God in front of them. They, they saw the miracles. They, they knew the promises of a Messiah. But they wanted him to be a Messiah on a white horse and a wielding a sword and driving out the Romans. Jesus came to drive out the devil, conquer 
death, hell, and the grave. He came to defeat sin. The Lord's picture of this is very different. The Lord's picture is it's boundless. Boundless. The kingdom of God, promises of God, cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. That was in our Psalm 50. We find all these things belong to God. The, your very breath belongs to God. So everything belongs to him, and we are partakers of it. Verse 23. <laughs> Go to the highways and byways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. The highways and hedges go to the tramps, the squatters, those sleeping in the hedgerows, <laughs> those who have no homes, <laughs> those who sleep behind walls and fences, the wanderers. <laughs> they find that this outlying area, anyone on the outskirts of the city, go and get them, referring to the Gentiles also and those who were considered unclean by the Pharisees. And he says, compel them to come in. And the word compel here is one that's like, you've got to, you've got to Im impress upon them the importance of this decision. The importance of the decision to come to the feast. The importance of the decision to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've got to know the importance of this because that's, that's a compelling force because the feast is coming. Christ is going to return, and they've got to be ready, and we've got to be ready, and so he's telling, compel them to come to the feast. Now, it's an earnest persuasion, but God will never go against your will. There can be deep sorrow, sickness, pain, fear, whatever it takes. You know, there was a time, what was it, 9-11? There was a great resurgence of people coming to church, there was uh, uh, COVID, you know, when you couldn't come and then you could. You know, all these things shake people's attention. And, and they, you know, they got to find an answer. But as soon as things level out, I have an excuse. <laughs> it's like Saul on the road to Damascus. When Jesus comes and says, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. <laughs> and what that means is the oxen, if you ever, if you ever been behind uh, a, an animal that likes to kick, <laughs> believe me, you, you don't want to be there. So the oxen ha would have a tendency to kick back at the driver and kick back at the um, cart. And if you're sitting on the front of the cart and they're kicking, you're the receiver. <laughs> so what they would do is they'd put a board across there with spikes in it. And when the oxen would kick, they would kick into those spikes. And that's what God is asking, telling Saul. It's, it's, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. You're kicking against everything that, I've, that I am, and it's hurting you. <laughs> and so we find in our persuasion or in our appeal that people running from God are finding themselves in a place where they are hurting and trying to disprove God. <laughs> so what means will God use? He will use anything at his disposal. Well, God will use the truth of his word, the exhortation, preaching, singing, uh, instructions, long-suffering, love, meekness, gentleness, perseverance, and sometimes God will use even drastic measures to what? To waken people up that this life is only temporary. In verse 24, For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper those who have refused the jews who re the hebrew people who refused jesus as the messiah they will never taste of this supper and so this is jesus his illustration of how people can be expecting something and when it happens it's not the way they thought it would be and so they reject it and some people have this concept of God that is it's like the God that I'm thinking of is <laughs> not the God of the Bible and so by instruction and by knowing the word and knowing that Christ loves them forgives them and has a place for them we know that uh, he wants us to come and be part of our of our life Revelation 19 9 and he said to me right blessed are they which are called unto this the marriage supper of the lamb the great banquet so 
we have a great banquet we're headed towards, and that's when in, with Christ in heaven. So the bride, the banquet, the bride is you and I. The groom is Christ. He is the Messiah, and he's come to save us from our sins. And so <laughs> a certain man, God, had a great supper, and he invited a whole nation and sent his messenger or servants to the su- at supper time. He told them it was coming. Now he sent them out when it's all prepared. The Messiah has come. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said, I have bought a piece of ground, <laughs> and I must go see it. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. <laughs> I must go see them, see if they're dead. Still another said, I've been married, and my wife told me I can't go. So that servant came and repeated these things to the master. Then the master of the house says, great compassion, said, go and get all those who are considered unworthy. Invite them to come. And the servant said, master, it is done. I've invited all of them, but there's still room. Now there's still room for more people to enter the kingdom of God before Jesus returns. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and helpless, uh, highways and and hedges and compel them to come in (laughs) that my house may be full. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. So there's a choice. There There are decisions to be made. We want Christ to guide us in our choices. Jesus, we thank you for hearing, hearing our prayers. Thank you for your word that teaches us, instructs us in righteousness. We thank you, Lord, for how you touch our lives in a, in a very real way, that you nourish our soul with your spirit and your word. It gives us strength. It gives us knowledge and understanding. Most of all, it speaks of your compassion and your desire to bring more into the kingdom of God. Help us, Lord, as your servants, to be a faithful witness to bring more into the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.